Welcome to Café Rollist. At Café Rollist, we are blessed having very brave guests who wake up very early. Uh, Max, could you introduce uh, yourself and tell us what's the weather like this morning in uh, California? Yeah, totally. Uh, really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I have no idea what the weather is like today because it's still pretty dark now. <laughs> um, but it's, it's about 6 a.m. here in uh, Oakland, California, where I'm based in. Uh, so, uh, like Cal mentioned, hey, my name is Max Pfeffer. I'm a tabletop role playing game designer based here in the Bay Area. And I have a new game coming out called Hanukkah Goblins, which comes out tomorrow. Um, so, we're on the podcast today to kind of talk about that game a little bit. Exciting. I got a couple ice breaking questions. Uh, this sideshow sort of was born out of the the COVID situation, uh, what's your routine like at the moment? Is it uh, affected in any way by uh, the pandemic? Yeah, so my day job, is, I'm a water resources engineer by day and then tabletop designer by night. So my day job actually hasn't been affected too much that I was able to transition pretty much from uh, like working in the office to working remotely. Um, so the work side has not been affected, thankfully, because um, I, I love what I do during my day job and I'm thankful that I'm still able to do it. Routine wise though, I mean, we're, we're just kind of stuck in our houses. Um, for those that don't know, the Bay Area of California is now on lockdown that um, we're, we're not supposed to be traveling, we're not supposed to be gathering at all. So California and specifically the Bay Area is not, not somewhere you want to be right now. I, being looking at New Zealand, looking at Australia, it's like, hey, you know, it'd be kind of nice to be down there. Yeah, here but, in London, know, I, I we love... are about to go into tier three, which is uh, uh -huh. the third part of a rather complicated multi tiered system, which yeah. is confusing. But long story short, I stay home. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, right. that's what I it's do. It's so interesting that everyone has all these different lockdown procedures. And like, even in the US, it's not consistent because of, you know, the U.S. being the U.S. and the difference between like Canada and here and what's going on with you in, in the U.K. and then just everywhere. It's, um, you know, we're, we're all just trying to do our best. And did you pick up any new interest, hobby or skill uh, recently? Actually, tabletop game design is something I picked up during the pandemic. Um, so we were already playing indie tabletop games uh, before the pandemic, and then we just transitioned to playing them over Zoom. But um, this has kind of been an interesting design point for me as well, um, because prior to the pandemic, uh, I used I was doing stained glass and fused glass art, and that was my creative outlet. Uh, but since the pandemic hit, I haven't been able to do that because I haven't been able to go into the studio because uh, it's not it's not safe for with COVID precautions. So um, it's I kind of just came across tabletop design like I was playing these games a lot and just one day like my friend kind of motivated me I was like no we can actually make our own games that I was so it, we were so inspired by everything we were seeing on itch everything that was coming out through the Ennies in these um the Ennie awards through um uh through Gen Con of just all these really cool games coming out like Sleepaways uh by Jay Dragon we've been playing that a lot and it's it's just so cool to see what's out there. And it really inspired me to do tabletop design. Oh, it's funny. We, I, we got that in common. I, I had a game project, which is my first one, which really took on Steam uh, due to, to the lockdown and being unemployed uh, also at the, mm -hmm. at the moment. But so uh, Anuka Goblins is your first game design project then? It's the first... I'll say the first big one that I did put one on itch earlier, um, but it was it was more kind of an exercise and it, it's kind of a game, but th I would say this is kind of the first like real game that I'm really trying to put out there publicly um, on, hey, we did this game, I'm really proud of it. And I think it's got um, the social context for it is really important as well for having diverse representation of games in there and especially in the Jewish space that um, there's only been a, a couple popular ones that have gotten out there in the indie space and kind of one notable one is Doikat uh, by Riley Rethal and uh, Jay-Z, J.R. I think Rosenblum, um, I'd have to check the name exactly, but 
this was an anthology of Jewish games, which uh, just got released on itch a couple days ago. So it's, to me, it's really important, um, not even just within the Jewish space, but for all people that we have diverse games out there and we're, and we're able to put these games out there. We have um, the resources to be able to do that. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm just happy I was able to do it. Yeah, there's been uh, a bit of uh, appearance of Jewishness in the, the discourse lately. I remember, it probably didn't start with that, but when I started uh, noticing uh, recently was when the uh, the discussion was about the use of no or not of golems in D&D 5th edition, and following that, I believe it's Anna Schaffer, who I saw starting publishing a game about golems yeah. uh, themselves. So it's it's very cool to see that that content coming out. Exactly. Yeah. There, there's a lot of really cool designers that have been making games that are starting to become more popular, like kind of Schaefer with, I believe the game's called Mud, um, which is, um, I believe, kickstarted earlier and it'll be coming soon. Um, and they're all of the diner, designers who associated with Doikat, um, Adira Slattery, um, who has made uh, the game Poseidon as part of the Brain Trust Science Bundle, was the cultural consultant actually for my game. Um, so really thankful for Adira to be on my project and uh, some other big names, Lucian Khan with Ma uh, Malgoths and Visigoths, another Jewish designer. Um, and even for Jewish designers, Jewish themes get put in your game without you even knowing it, without you even specifically calling things out. Um, that Hanukkah Goblins is very much a Jewish game and at its surface, it's Jewish. Um, but how it's written and how I want people to play it are also very Jewish in this kind of indirect way, which is something I, like, I wanna talk about more like as the game gets out there, write a blog post or something, be like, hey, yes, there's Hebrew in this game, but did you realize the mechanics are also Jewish? That um, asking lots of questions is a very Jewish principle. Um, that's been a part of the um, the scripture. It's been part of the religion, culture, everything. That um, question everything. You should always be questioning what you're doing, um, asking questions. Um, and I just pose that throughout the game of like, if, if you don't like my rules or if. If something doesn't feel right to you, talk about it in your group, question why you might be feeling that way or whatnot. So that's kind of the philosophical end of the game, but it's, um, yeah, there's a lot of cool Jewish designers out there. So on, on the practical side, so I put on a, a little picture of your, your cover yeah. for Hanukkah Goblins. What, what is it about? Uh, I don't know where it's best to start with the project right away or with Hanukkah itself, because uh, I myself don't know much about Hanukkah. I must confess that my knowledge about, of Hanukkah is probably limited to two terrible sources, which would be Friends and South Park. I cannot imagine worse sources than that. Uh, so yeah, yeah, exactly. Totally. And, and that's the funny thing about Hanukkah, too, is um, those media sources is where a lot of people get information about Judaism and get information about Hanukkah, um, which has been popularized by modern Judaism that um, rabbis and whatnot, and just part of the cultural people want that representation in the main culture that uh, to normalize Judaism. But then on the flip side, we get these kind of not great representations of Judaism, like in South Park that South Park is, I mean, fully satire, so it's, everything should be a joke. But, you know, not everyone really thinks of those as jokes. You get, you, you can start internalizing those stereotypes, and you can start internalizing these negative portrayals, um, and then it just perpetuates everywhere. So, and Hanukkah actually is not, the, it's not even remotely close to the most important Jewish holiday, but that's what most people think of with Judaism, right? Because you're told, uh, like, society or like media has told you that oh yeah Hanukkah like it's at the same time as Christmas and all that and you think Judaism which that's a good thing we like having um some representation is good it's um it's doing the additional work to say yes awesome you're in the door you know about Hanukkah now let's let's show you more about the culture and explain why Hanukkah is not actually our 
biggest holiday. It's just due to its proximity to Christmas, it's a way to kind of get Judaism in the door with people that um, like gift giving was never really a part of the holiday uh, as a part of Hanukkah until modern tradition that Hanukkah is actually a, a wartime celebration um, and it rooted in history that it's about the uh, Maccabees revolt against um, the, I'm gonna put Syrian in quotations because that's the, um, the generalization that you could actually look at the exact name for that um, empire, but it was the Maccabees rising up against uh, religious oppression. And that's what the holiday is rooted in. And it's rooted in this miracle of, as the Maccabees were revolting, uh, they were in the temple and they were trying to um, light the uh, menorah that was in the temple. And they only had enough oil for one night. They're like, oh man, we can only light it can only light it for one night. And then the miracle of Hanukkah, which is the basis of the, the holiday, is that actually miraculously it lasted eight nights. So that's why Hanukkah lasts eight nights and it's celebrating uh, the Maccabees' uh, victory over the revolt. Um, but that's the high level overview of the holiday. Um, for those that are interested, there's a lot more history. It's actually a militaristic holiday that is even kind of supporting oppression itself. So as you, de as you delve deeper into it, it's, um, it's problematic. So um, we, we take it out the modern interpretation for now of Hanukkah is a good way for modern people to get in the door about Judaism um, on, most people have seen a dreidel or if they've, they've seen it on South Park or they've seen it on Seinfeld, um, they've seen menorahs and whatnot. So it's good to have that representation. And what we're doing is we're fighting for more and just overall fighting for underrepresented and marginalized people that Judaism is just a religion and we contain all sorts of people of marginalized backgrounds that we need to be doing everything we can to be uplifting voices wherever we can. Great. So that's, and, yeah, that's kind of the basis for the holiday. And then the game, I should probably talk about the game. Yeah, right? but at what, uh, that was my question. At what point those goblins uh, enter the, the play, uh, the tradition of that? What does uh, goblins have to do with uh, the Maccabees and uh, the celebration? Exactly. So goblins have nothing to do with the original holiday. <laughs> uh, so uh, for, for all that have never read the book, uh, so my game, Hanukkah Goblins, is based off of the 1989 book by Eric Kimmel. Uh, and the book is called Herschel and the Hanukkah Goblins. And this book was put out uh, in the US. It was a children's uh, picture book. And I actually grew up reading it, um, that it was always a part of our Hanukkah tradition to... Uh, read this book and flip through it. And it was, it's this fantastical story about uh, Herschel of Ostropol comes into a town, uh, this fictitious town. There's no basis for it, but looking at the photos in the book, you could kind of assume it's maybe Eastern Europe. It might be Switzerland, but it's a snow covered kind of Alpine town. Um, and Herschel comes into town and sees that there's no Hanukkah. In, in town and Herschel's like, well, tonight's the first night. Shouldn't you be celebrating Hanukkah? And how the story goes is the town is like, oh no, the goblins don't want us to celebrate Hanukkah. They, they, they're up in the temple on the hill and they're scary and all that. So the book is about Herschel meeting all these goblins, tricking them um, in order to um, celebrate Hanukkah. That the book goes through several nights of Hanukkah and. Uh, you come across various goblins um, and Herschel tricks all of them and eventually tricks the king of all the goblins, the goblin king, uh, in order to be able to celebrate Hanukkah. So the, the book ends with the goblins have been defeated and everyone in the town gets to celebrate Hanukkah. So at its at surface level, it's a cute Hanukkah story that um, a lot of people my age, so people in their uh, late 20s, early 30s, really engaged with um, and have positive memories as children. So that's where the concept of the Hanukkah Goblin came from. And then uh, as we go forward, I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about my game and actually how it's a satire of the original book. Yeah, sorry, it's a steep hill to climb as we, we have 
We have a lot to learn exactly. today, but it's a great opportunity yeah. to to learn a, a little bit more. So, so the game finally. <laughs> yeah, the game. <laughs> yeah, so the game. So, like I mentioned, is it's a satire of the original book, actually. That. Um, so, like I mentioned, it's kind of this fantastical story, and it was really popular amongst kids. But as an adult now, and kind of putting a critical eye on the book, there's anti-Semitic representations of Jewish people in this book that is considered a Jewish children's book. That that's it's kind of contrary to what you might think of. Um, I mean, it, it's it represents an important kind of cultural part for Jews my age. That um, this book was really really fun to have this put out as a something in the media that is representation. But you look at the goblins uh, from the times of J.R.R. Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings, there's been anti-Semitism and racism in our fantasy worlds that you look at elves, you look at goblins, dwarves, orcs in particular with J.R.R. Tolkien's books and just the negative stereotypes that they put out. I mean, it's specifically with orcs that orcs have long been scapegoats for racism for black people. Um, and that has just infiltrated the rest of the fantasy community. So in Kimmel's book with goblins in particular, um, Kimmel is reinforcing those stereotypes unintentional, un unintentionally probably that I'm, I'm not out here to say, Eric Kimmel, you like, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing anything with that. All I'm doing is pointing out that this book has perpetuated negative Jewish stereotypes that goblins are greedy, that goblins are stupid, goblins are slaves, that when you actually read the book, the goblin king at the very end calls all of his goblins slaves. And I mean, if that is not a stereotype and um, negative representation of Jews, I mean, that, that kind of fits all of the stereotypes that have been been put out there by Jewish people. So the game starts with actually as putting that on its head that after, after the Goblin King has been defeated by Herschel, you are a group of Hanukkah goblins that um, after, after the Goblin King has um, been defeated, you actually have learned from Herschel's trials that Herschel put you through in that book that you've come around to Judaism and you've come to accept Hanukkah so what the book is and the game is all about is you are now this crew of Hanukkah goblins. You are now Jewish goblins that you are now going around trying to spread Hanukkah spirit everywhere you can. And there's various scenarios that you can play through. Um, and I built it as a collaborative storytelling game that there's, there's no GM. Uh, a GM is optional if you're playing specifically with kids or maybe with people who've never played with tabletop games. I do include mechanics in there about how do you get new people into gaming um, or how do you get young kids into gaming that kids are so great with storytelling, um, but not so not necessarily so great with rules and mechanics. So I include guidance in there on how do you play this with a kid or how do you play it with somebody who doesn't want to read a book? So you can play Hanukkah Goblins with all your friends. In, in the article, I talk about playing with grandma that um, I really want to bring in new people to this that you can engage with Judaism, your own Judaism, or even just a non-Jew, that there's lots of context throughout the game on, um, one of the screenshots I put on Twitter is, one of the first things you see in the book is how to play this game if you're not Jewish. Because it's, it's always hard when something is put out as cultural content that, um, like if I'm marketing this as a Jewish game, I think non-Jews can be intimidated by that. They're like is this game for me? And my response is yes, <laughs> come play this game. Um, because it's really important that um, you can engage with other people's culture in a way that's both on your terms as a designer um, and do it in an accessible way that people can learn more about, well, what is Hanukkah? There's a, what is Hanukkah section of the book? Well, how do I play this game if I'm not Jewish? We've got a section for you. What if I don't know what a menorah is or a dreidel is? The end of the book is all definitions. I think I have like 20 or so definitions at the back um, to, to help you and give you resources. And I link to other websites as well. Like if you want more info, um, go here. So you're- Yeah, definitely give me the 
the link afterwards and I'll put them in the description of the episode so people can find them easily. Yeah, sure. Um, and luckily, there's lots of resources online. I just linked to one in particular, Chabad.org, which has a lot of good information online about Judaism in general and also specifically about Hanukkah because uh, lots of people are interested in Hanukkah specifically. Um, so yeah, the game is, it's collaborative storytelling about your crew of Hanukkah goblins. And I include various scenarios that you can play through on um, how you can engage with your town, how, how um, oops, sorry. Um, so I think there, there are six scenarios in the book that um, are a starting point for your story that um, I'm, I'm kind of classifying this game as a lyrical GM list or GM agnostic game that's all about collaborative storytelling. So what I've really done is I've given everyone the sandbox that this is a world I think is really interesting that you get to play as a Hanukkah goblin. You could have a donut launcher, you could have, or a Sufganiyot launcher. Uh, Sufganiyot is a Jewish donut that is typically eaten around Hanukkah. And these special items, which are fun, you get to choose a type and it's similar to Quest in the regard of like, let's kind of do some basic character creation and then we'll put you on your story to start with. So I, wa I want to create the environment for people to, to do their own storytelling rather than being uh, prescriptive, uh, if you will. That, that's always been my play style is creating something that's, it gives you enough to be able to understand the world, understand what kind of game you're playing and then the mechanics get out of your way of like you, the mechanics are there to help you tell your story rather than dictate the story you're trying to tell. Um, so that, that's kind of been my design philosophy for this game. You, you mentioned uh, bagels and uh, it's, I know it's the wrong season, but uh, you, you giving me a craving for a recipe, uh, I was told uh, for mazo crackers, uh, chocolate and caramel coated, and um, yeah, I, oh, need, yeah. I still need to do that that recipe uh, at home. Uh, I, I was I, I was very uh, lucky to be invited for a Passover celebration uh, when I, I visited friends uh, in New York, and uh, yeah, th these are excellent memories. Uh, You've got a so Anuka is eight days longer. Uh, so is sort of your your campaign. You got uh, special events planned. Well, tomorrow yeah. is the release of your game. Then the the following days, uh, what what's going on? I know it's supposed to be surprises, but can you tease us a bit? Uh? <laughs> yeah. So well, originally, so there there's actually been a couple of news article written about the game. Uh, it was originally supposed to come out on Thursday, and that was going to be part of the the game launch surprise. It's like, hey, there's an article written about it. Um, but it came out early, so that's great. We had a we had a surprise of the surprise. <laughs> um, but the print version of the article does still come out on Thursday, so I can still say that that the the print version is a surprise. Um, but yeah, so uh, we're doing special events through Hanukkah. Um, that um, well, as I was creating this game and just realizing that this is this is important for representation, and not even just from a Jewish perspective. This is this is good things to put out there to talk about underrepresented people in the game industry. So um, I kind of wanted to lean into the, the Jewish aspects of the game as well to talk about the game through Hanukkah, that the timing is good um, to, to kind of raise funds as well. So what I'm doing for this Hanukkah launch fundraiser is um, all uh, portions, of the, uh, portions of the game sales are going to be going to a charitable organization that I really admire which is People's Breakfast Oakland. And they are a black grassroots organization based here where I live in Oakland, California. And they are all about serving the houseless community here in Oakland. That um, one core theme of Judaism in Hanukkah specifically is oppression. Oppression of people who have, have done nothing um, to, um, maybe not done nothing in the case of Hanukkah, but the, oppression of marginalized people is a theme of Judaism in Hanukkah. And as we go into the winter time, as COVID intensifies here in the US, the houseless pop population has been failed by our government here in Oakland, our government in California and the United States overall of, they don't have adequate access to housing, um, medical resources, food, shelter, all those things. 
And People's Breakfast Oakland does a great job of, they are in the community every weekend. You can go on their Instagram, follow them on Twitter, Instagram, all that. And you can see they're out in the community serving food. They're out there doing a tent drive as the, as the weather starts to get worse and rain comes, they're asking for donations of tents. They're asking for donation of money. And they're, they're out doing even Reiki healing sessions for people that it's not always just about, do you have your basic needs? Getting your medical needs served is very important as well. So um, I really wanted to tie in the, the theme of oppression to a fundraiser for a charitable organization that I really admire. So um, portions of the sales of the game um, $2 for every electronic copy and $4 for every soft cover copy are going to be donated to People's Breakfast Oakland at the end of Hanukkah. So all of the pre-orders, everything that gets sold through Hanukkah, portions of those sales are going to go to People's Breakfast Oakland. Um, and at $500, if we get $500 in total sales, which we're getting, we're almost there with the pre-orders, which is great. Uh, I'm going to increase that donation to $3 and $5 since that was really important to me for this game that I don't want to be like, I don't want to be making money off of Hanukkah, basically, that I want to be using this as a way to create more opportunities and create ways to donate. Um, that That's um, kind of why I've centered it around that. And then the special events and uh, there's going to be giveaways. Uh, during Hanukkah, and I won't tell you what those are yet, but um, you can follow me on Twitter. On, and I believe the first uh, announcement will be on Friday uh, for what that surprise is. But um, I think after our podcast today, I'll put up the schedule of events of um, one thing I can announce is on December 15th, we are doing an actual play on Twitch on uh, GoJG's channel or Jeff's um, for many of you who uh, follow them on Twitch. Jess is a queer streamer on Twitch, an amazing community organizer, lover of tabletop games, lover of video games, and has created such an amazing and open community. Um, and so I'm really excited to be able to do an actual play on Jess's channel. We got some great people coming. Um, I'm blanking on everyone's names right now, but uh, <laughs> I gave it to Callum so we can include it. Um, so, Rather than forget someone on air, um, go look at the description. I have headshots of everyone. Um, these are all people I really admire that when I was talking with Jess about the game and doing this actual play and talking about, oh, who, who could people come and play? Um, and we, we put out a casting call. We put out an application. And then there was just so much interest that it was really incredible to see how many people wanted to engage with Hanukkah and Hanukkah goblins that um, we actually have a crew of all non-Jewish people uh, and me on the, on the game. So I, I think it's gonna be really cool to me as a Jewish game designer, getting people to play my Jewish game that are non-Jews. I mean, that's like the dream of getting people to engage with this and, and showing them how you can engage with a game that's not in your culture and do it in a respectful way. I was wondering. Uh, you mentioned the the setting and one of the well the the inspiration, which is uh, Eschel, uh, and you said it was a, an Alpine setting. So you you kept this uh, Central European setting, or how do, does that translate uh, in the game? Doesn't tra translate at all. It, it, <laughs> on the cover, it's really for the pretty cover that um, uh, wanted to. Um, Kind of evoke the original style a little bit um, to reinforce the satire that um, when you look at the original game uh, or the original book by Herschel uh, in was um, illustrated by uh, Trina and forgetting their last name. I mean, it's, it's a really beautiful book. Um, and what I wanted to do uh, with my art for the game, which I was commissioned by uh, uh, the illustrator was Callie Hayes, uh, which if you follow me on Twitter, I'm, Ha, uh, and go to the itch page, you could find Callie's portfolio. They did an amazing job with the art. Oh my God, I'm so happy with the art. Uh, so the Alpine uh, scene you're talking about, it, it's on the cover. That's, that's the only place it really is, that there's no like Eurocentric elements to the game. Um, but the, the purpose for that on the cover was to evoke um, 
uh, to reinforce the theme of satire with the game as well, that the art style is completely different, um, but it's, um, it's taking a similar um, artistic vision, if you will, or mm -hmm. like a similar setting, um, but pull, putting on its head that, oh, these are now cartoony, cute, approachable, and like fun goblins that um, look like these great characters. They have all these special items. And the town below you see is the one town they could live in. But there's nothing that says you have to play in this Alpine village. I don't think I even say the word Alpine anywhere in the book. <laughs> um, so uh, I do hope that um, people could play in any setting they want. They could play this game in Oakland. They could play this game in the countryside. They could play this game in North Africa. They could set this game wherever you want. Um, and um, yeah. Great. Uh, I was asking you the question in part because uh, I've got over the last few months I've developed an interest, especially in uh, tabletop RPG communities outside of of the US. Uh, we had a, a panel about that at Metatopia with uh, Pam Punzalan, uh, Diogo from Brazil and Alan uh, from uh, from oh, where was he? Uh, not sure if he, uh, I'm not sure anyway. He was from Italy. He lives in Germany, and he was also from Ethiopia. I think. I think. I hope I'm not. I'm not uh, having this wrong. Uh, but I, I was wondering if uh, you were engaged with the Jewish community outside of the the US as well. If you had any feedback from there, I, I'm not aware how. Uh, as you mentioned, Hanukkah, like a lot, I mean, like Christmas itself has been uh, brought forward in part as a, a process of uh, selling stuff to people, I assume, both for presentation, but at the same time uh, with commercial intent. And those things are often originated in the US. Uh, I don't know how much Hanukkah is celebrated as it is in the US, outside of the US. And I was wondering, Hanukkah Goblins, if you had exchanges or feedback from from people in Europe, in Northern Africa, and uh, and other communities, uh, uh, Jewish communities around the world. I haven't, but I would love to. That uh, if they have feedback on the game, I would love to do it. And you know, if, if they have awesome ways they may want to collaborate, I would love to do a second edition and do it as Jewish, because. Uh, as the cover kind of suggests, this is a very, um, the art style is evoking this kind of Ashkenazi Jew experience that um, from the cover art, but throughout the game, there's a whole section on, uh, so an oneg is this concept of a, like a Jewish gathering uh, where there's food, there's dancing, it's like a party basically. And in that scene um, of where you could role play an oneg scene in your game, I actually include Jewish foods from around the world as specific inclusions. Um, so we have things like bunuelos from Latin America. We have sanbat wat, which is Sabbath stew, um, which is uh, popular from with Ethiopian Jews. We have injera in there. We have um, laziji, which is from uh, the Sichuan region of China of it's a uh, chicken dish fried in oil with lots of chili peppers. And it was really important to me to look around the world and show that, and make sure it's obvious in the game at, in a particular that section that it is not just about Ashkenazi Jews and Sephardic Jews. So Ashkenazi Jews are from Eastern Europe and is pretty much what you see in the mass media. You see in Seinfeld, you, you see Adam Sandler's Eight Crazy Nights, which was a popular movie of that's really portraying Ashkenazi Jews. Um, and even things like uh, The Wonderful Mrs. Maisel, which you, which people may have watched on um, on Amazon Prime, or I mean, there, there's lots of Jewish shows out there that have Jewish themes. That's really putting out Ashkenazi Jew um, culture. But Jewish culture is around the world. Judaism is a Jewish tradition that there's a long um, and kind of troubled history of Judaism in Ethiopia that Ethiopia has a really beautiful Jewish tradition and they have gone through so many struggles with being recognized as a real Jewish community, uh, in particular being able to be uh, citizens of, um, of Israel. They went through a long struggle with that of actually being able to trace their heritage and say, no, we are, we are actually Jews here in Ethiopia. China also has a long tradition of Judaism that there's 
the, I believe the Kaifeng Torah, um, which is a very old Torah and um, Jewish community out there in China, which is just another representation that, I mean, Judaism is just a religion and it, and it includes people from all racial and cultural backgrounds. Um, so I wanted to kind of specifically include those elements in the game to remind people that when we're talking about Judaism, we we shouldn't be talking about just what has been put out there in the media. We need to be portraying the whole Jewish culture as best as we can. So I tried to do that in the game and show everyone um, some other traditions from around the world. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, if there, go, go if there are Jewish uh, designers outside the US uh, that want to collaborate on projects, hit me up on Twitter. I, I think it would be very interesting. I will try to to tag you. Maybe send a, a private message. Uh, there's there's someone. There's a famous uh, comics artist uh, in France uh, who's okay. Jewish, uh, Johan Svar, who I've been trying to interview for quite a while because he's also <laughs> a, a somewhat vocal uh, fan of tabletop role playing games. Uh, he's actually Great. about to release his own role playing game, and uh, I think through him and a few other people, there's been a bit more. Uh, I think I think it's historical sort of in France. There's been a bit more representation of uh, Sephardic traditions than Ashkenazi traditions because I would assume of the strong connection France has uh, and also complicated relationship with Northern Africa, uh, Morocco, Algeria, and, uh, and and so on. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know if any of his work crossed uh, successfully the the Atlantic. Uh, his famous works include uh, The Rabbi's Cat, which is a, a great graphic novel uh, about, yeah, I'm not sure yeah. when it's set. Yeah. And uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, for children, uh, much less about Jewish tradition, there's a little vampire and big vampire, which yeah. is having a, a theatrical release of an animated movie recently. He's also a movie director. He directed a biopic about a famous uh singer uh in a well, jewish singer actually uh serge gainsbourg uh oh, cool. here so yeah that would be i think i think it, it could it would probably sig help you signal boost uh your work so i, I need to to hook you up uh, with it <laughs> uh obviously not inappropriate to ask but uh, is there any chance to see a uh Passover goblins or for reason would that be inappropriate or is it something you you would consider um, so the only reason I include goblins is leaning into the Eric Kimmel book um that um to uh kind of specifically in that negative stereotypes about Jews and specifically in this context about Hanukkah so they're probably I I don't think I would make a Passover goblins game unless I was able to think of a different way to do it, like maybe as a sequel to this game, but um, I, I've i definitely put some thoughts out there about more Jewish games uh, centered around uh, more important holidays actually, that like, like all of our cultures that um, when we're putting out games, you're just getting a like, teeny teeny snapshot uh, into that culture of, um, in, of what we're about. Um, so with Hanukkah Goblins, you get a little bit of info about Hanukkah and the traditions associated with Hanukkah. And um, there's actually a whole sexual section in the game on Jewish prayers that I actually want non-Jewish people to go to this section and include a Jewish prayer in their game as an experience to be able to engage with Judaism more directly. Wow, um, that's, that's, so, that's strong. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a very strong connection that, um, there's a mechanical implication that you do get a bonus if you do one of these rituals. And one of them is lighting the Hanukkah candles. That lighting the Hanukkah candles is a very, very important Jewish tradition in regard to Hanukkah. That's that's the core time we can gather as Jews. You gather with your family, you gather with your congregation and you light the candles. So I was very careful when I wrote that. Very careful when I wrote the whole the ritual section that you, you as players are engaging with real Jewish culture and want to, I want you to engage with it, and, but I want you to do it on terms that are appropriate and sensitive. So there's there's a disclaimer in that section on how do you approach this, um, both as a Jew and a non-Jew, that 
just because you're Jewish doesn't mean you're not going to um, portray the culture badly, that uh, you just may be more familiar than somebody who's non-Jewish. So there's a section of uh, the game, it's like page 13 or 14, you'll actually see Hebrew in the game. Um, the first line is the Hebrew prayer. The second line is the English pronunciation. So you as a player, um, and I recommend if people are playing on Zoom, just choose one person to read that prayer. Otherwise it's gonna be Zoom nightmare. Um, but normally in a real, um, real telling, usually everyone's saying it together. And there's usually a song, a melody associated with, with all these songs. So I do include in there, you can look up the songs on YouTube, you can hear how everything's pronounced and you can do it yourself. Um, there's also the pronunciation, like the English phonetic pronunciation in there. And then also the translation of that prayer. Um, and for me, it was important to include that in the game since that's a way for people to engage with Judaism. And at least if they buy the game, it's on their shelf. They've seen it. They've seen these rituals and practices of Judaism. So that's another angle of representation as well of showing another glimpse into Judaism that we read Hebrew. We read Hebrew from right to left. We light Hanukkah candles from left to right and trying to include all these snippets of Jewish culture that um, if they play the game once, maybe they remember one thing. And that's a good thing, that the more we can do to represent people and represent their cultures in a popular, in a good way, um, that's a good thing, that this is just Judaism. Um, we need to be doing all of these with all cultures and all underrepresented backgrounds. So that, that's something I definitely feel passionate about and want to include with all of my game design is um, including representation for underrepresented people. Uh all cultures have individuals who have their own views about their own culture. Did you exactly. expect or did you get any any sort of uh, negative feedback from Judaic uh, individual who who would not be welcoming of this idea of, for instance, of people using prayers while not being uh, Jewish themselves and so on? Or, or was that welcome so far by the wider Jewish community? We'll see when the game launches because mm -hmm. um, I don't think that has been talked about yet because the, the, no one's really seen the game text until tomorrow. And that's definitely a point of criticism that is valid, that um, I completely appreciate that somebody may not want that um, in, out there in the game. Um, but to me, I thought it was important. Um, and I did, I hired a Jewish cultural consultant to help me on the game, Adira Slattery, to read through and I'm uh, talking with Adira on um, that that's a very sensitive topic, uh, including Jewish prayer in there. So that is, that's criticism I'm willing to accept um, and willing to say, I, I completely appreciate your viewpoint and this is how I look at it. And we can agree to disagree on that one, that um, as long as the portrayal I put forward is accurate, um, I think it's important for representation that um, I want people to do this in a sensitive way. I think I even write in there saying, if you're not comfortable, do, if you don't think you can do this in a sensitive way, don't do it. Um, but I want, I encourage you to do it and to encourage you to try that Judaism is a very diverse religion, that there's lots of various sects of Judaism. And I was raised in the reform sect of Judaism. So someone from a different sect of Judaism, uh, the pop, the ones that come to the head are, um, there's conservative Judaism, there's Reconstruction, Reconstructionist Judaism, there is Hasidic Judaism, there's all these aspects of, um, and subcultures within Judaism, and they're going to have their own reactions to including something like this. So um, it's, it's very valid uh, opinion to have, and I respect someone if they don't think that's appropriate, but I think I've done it in a way that's respectful and not um, including the context for everything, including why Jews do these prayers, why we do them. Because um, as a kid, I was always raised that um, you want people to engage with your Jewish culture, that um, growing up, my mom would come into um, our school, like our elementary school, and we would come play dreidel. And we would play dreidel with the entire class. And we would make these little candy dreidels with pretzels and chocolate and marshmallows. 
and it was a fun activity for people to do in the um in the in the holiday season and to be able to engage with uh hanukkah and judaism in a small way so to me it's things like that are important for people to bring people in so that's what i've tried to do with this prayer section is go one step beyond just hanukkah goblins because that's that's the hook that's what gets people in and then getting them to read more about all these various Jewish traditions, Jewish rituals that make this a very Jewish game. Um, so yeah, I, I we, we've definitely thought about that coming out um, and we'll see, we'll see what people say. Um, but there have been two news articles about it already, which is really exciting. Um, the Jewish Weekly of Northern California put out um, an article which I have linked in my itch page and Maya uh, was the writer for that, did an amazing job. And then just this morning, the Jerusalem Post, which is really popular in Israel, picked up the article. So as people wake up today, they can see it on the Jewish Post, or the, excuse me, the Jerusalem Post, uh, and picked up that article. So um, we'll see. Hopefully I get feedback, and at the very least, I learned something. Um, and uh, I'm completely open to feedback. Well, it's it's a work of art, uh, I imagine, and it's about giving out a, a message, which is your own. I, I was just getting reminded that one of the last movies I, I saw, uh, which centered on the, the the Jewish culture, was Disobedience with Rachel Weisz and uh, Rachel McAdams, and uh, that was a highly uh, controversial, as far as I uh, well. I mean, when you watch a movie, you can imagine it can be controversial among conservative, more conservative-minded in individuals. So, but it's doesn't mean it's it's not valid. On the contrary, it's it's about getting a message out. And I mean, it's Jewish society culture is as complex as any other culture. You've got, I mean, Christian. I'm not, I'm not. I consider myself more an agnostic than a, a Catholic or a Christian in any way. And you have very devout very conservative and you got very devout individual who are not necessarily matching the what's under conservatism nowadays so uh it's normal that there are different voices and and uh dialogue uh, hopefully uh yeah. between those uh, uh i just and had a art, yep go ahead sorry oh, and just art is tricky too because you're really you're trying to lean into something emotional with art right you're tapping into something there and um one particular series that comes to mind is Unorthodox, which is on Netflix, which is about um, a Jewish girl in Williams, Williamsburg who breaks out of the Hasidic Jewish, uh, Jewish tradition. And that's, it was a really powerful thing as me as a Jewish person to see that, but it's, it's a Hasidic person would see that and could be really offended potentially, or somebody else in Judaism of putting those themes out there and of like this is not necessarily a positive portrayal of Judaism because there's you're sh they're showing this xenophobic culture you're showing this like this oppression within the Jewish community and I actually do include that in my game as well of racism within the Jewish community that it's a very real thing um, so that that is included as kind of a reminder in there as a content warning um, but it's it's hard with art that. You're, you're trying to evoke something very emotional, but that's something that's very, um, it's emotional <laughs> that people have opinions about that. And it's, it's difficult with art forms that you're, you're trying to put out some great piece of work and that that's going to tap into something that people have strong feelings about. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, sorry, going a bit backward, uh, yeah. but uh, about the goblins and Anuka. Uh, so there's this mm -hmm. work by Kimmel. I mean, the, you you mentioned the the stereotypes there. Uh, the, as you entirely right, the, there's a lot of stereotyping going on in fantasy, of which we're not even aware. Recently, I found out about the witches and Roald Dahl and Roald Dahl's background in that. But I was wondering, was was it Kimmel who brought up the idea of goblins in Anuka, or was it something which belonged to a an older tradition of fantastical creatures mm -hmm. revolving around the festival? And it just well, not just but like like Tolkien and other individuals pulled out of uh, sure. popular traditions and formalized it in, in, a, in a piece of work. Huh? Yeah, if, if I were to put a hypothesis and kind of shoot from the hip here on <laughs> where it comes from, to my knowledge, 
before Kimmel, uh, before Kimmel's book, there was no association with Hanukkah specifically with goblins, that there was no Hanukkah goblins before Kimmel's book. Um, and I, I did a little research. I don't think, I don't think there was, but you know, new information comes up all the time. And I'm happy to correct that. Um, but that association didn't come in until Kimmel, but the associations with goblins and Jewish people were, were there since Tolkien. Um, and possibly even earlier than that, but Tolkien definitely popularized these and put it into the, the main media sources. And that's our, our fantasy, um, our fantasy settings built upon that structure Tolkien built in these, um, these negative stereotypes of all sorts of people. Um, like we talked about the dwarves, the goblins, the orcs, and even elves and humans that you're pulling human or you're pulling men humans out from all these other races and then you're portraying elves as these kind of higher beings and humans as the heroes and in the movies and i believe also in the books i haven't read all the books but they are all white characters and then when you look at orcs they are called uh, i think sallow sallow colored creatures in the original book uh, for tolkien and it is scapegoating black people with orcs and dwarves and goblins and Jews and all these stereotypes that were included that have created the foundation for fantasy that we know in the modern era that Dungeons and Dragons was built with these themes in mind that Tolkien put out into the media. And obviously D&D pulls from tons of sources on that, but that's, that's our kind of cornerstone here is now we have D&D, which is our most popular tabletop product and to this day, they're still not willing to change these practices on racist inclusions within their game that Tasha's, um, uh, Tasha's College and Everything includes a small section on um, how you can get away from race in your game. <laughs> tiny, tiny, like a little <laughs> bit, which I mean, that, that's, that's great. They're, they're moving in the, the right direction. And I appreciate that this is a giant game company owned by Hasbro, which is the, the giant conglomerate of um, media, toys, games, and all that. But it's not enough. And they are making, uh, how many probably millions of dollars they're making off of, of Tasha's and how many pre-orders were based off of this idea that Tasha's was going to solve the race problem of D&D and it didn't. And then even just the past couple of days with Cyberpunk 2077 with the transphobia that is in that game, it's showing that our games that are being put out now are still a problem. That this isn't something like, oh, you're complaining about like old D&D. You're, you're complaining about Karatur, things that are these old uh, advanced Dungeons and Dragons references from the late 80s, early 90s. But no, these, these problems are here and now and in being in the games released today um yeah and the, the it was just coming on french twitter well french twitter there's no french twitter but on french ttrpg yeah. fans uh, on twitter yesterday evening yeah. that there's actually a very uh, nefarious crowdfunding campaign at the moment for something which is blatantly uh, islamophobic anti-semitic it's even pulling the rules from a, a game which is infamous for being uh problematic on so many levels and it's it's making a quite a lot of money and there's a campaign going on for the for the game to be entirely removed from the french crowdfunding platform so those issues are are definitely alive and uh and uh yeah it's not like hey we took all the kids to see ginger list uh, uh at school so we can tap ourselves on the back and say job down uh, we vanquish anti-semitism it's uh well, I play Hanukkah fight. Goblins. I bought a Jewish game. Like, no, it's there. This is something. That, it's a much bigger fight, and um, just the game industry is just one example. Great. Well, we're almost at the one-hour mark. Is there anything else we we missed that you'd like to to mention before we part? Yeah, I think um, the you know, there's just so much to talk about this. So, like, <laughs> I, I focus on the representation angle a lot. But I do want to, I want to focus on the happy angles as well. That one, my favorite part of the book actually is the dedication page. That uh, the first page of the book, I actually dedicate this book to the uh, Asians Represent community and that podcast and all of that. Um, so 
Daniel Chang, or sorry, <laughs> Daniel Kwan, Ag Agatha Chang, Amar Ajaz, Steve Hun, and the whole community I recognize as my um, inspiration for the game, for everything that podcast series has done for uh, increasing representation, talking about equity in games, um, and really critically breaking down D and D products uh, on their streams. It's and podcasts. It's that it was really thought provoking for me and got me on this path. So I dedicated the game to them, um, which was really cool for me because that like it was so meaningful to be able to to do that um, and like ha have a game where I could do that and be like this is my this was my inspiration for the game. So I, I also want to focus on the happy things and not just the um, the negative things we're trying to fight against. Um, but it's a, it's a shout out, shout out to all of them because they, they've they been out here doing the work and inspired me. So I'm, I'm here trying to also do the work as well. So, you know, the happy things, without spoiling anything, what do you actually do as a goblin in Anuka Goblin? Is there... What, what sort of feat do you do you achieve or what sort of challenge you need to to face uh, when you you play sure. the game yeah so each scenario i have in the game has a different objective like one uh in particular is uh you and your hanukkah goblin friends are walking around town and you come across this argument in the town square that there are goblins in town and and villagers fighting uh, and you come across what what is going on and they're verbally arguing they're not physically fighting uh, and they're saying oh, the goblins stole the hanukkah candles and the goblins are like no we didn't steal the hanukkah candles we don't we don't want your hanukkah candles and the scenario is do you want to go help find the candles and what happens and that's the starting point for one scenario another one is um it, it actually includes a shade or shadeen which is the plural of shade, which is a the idea of a Jewish, I'm going to call it demon. It's That's kind of the, the analog we would use in Christianity as a demon. And it's this uh, creature that's somewhere between the divine and mortal, or a divine and human. But it's this long-lived creature who kind of feeds into negative aspects of people. And there's um, it, it's included throughout the, the, the text of Judaism. So there's, I included in the game, um, of you can interact with a shade that you walk into town and you, you notice the Hanukkah spirit is just depressed everywhere. And you're like, well, what's going on? And then you walk past the synagogue and you see this, this bird-like footprint on the ground. And you as a goblin, you know, oh, that's a shade. And there's a little call out section on what is a shade? What is shadeen? How do you defend, your, defend yourself against a shade? How do you defeat it? So um, those are two scenario examples that are in the game that I think are interesting. And they, they cater to a different level of the game community that if you're doing the candles one, you're probably gonna play a short game. Maybe you're playing with kids. Maybe if you're playing with a shade in your game, you're a more advanced gamer and you're, you're ready to engage with um, some more complicated creatures, more complicated mechanics. Cool. Okay, we are yeah. at an end, and I'm like, oh, I should have brought up. I always brought up my favorite game, uh, French game, which is oh. Nephilim. And that's probably a moment mm -hmm. when I made a bit of research about Jewish traditions as, as well, because there, there's a lot of things revolving around the Kabbalah, which I don't think were made. Uh, I, I don't see how it could happen because it's in French, but I would be very curious to uh, have someone look deeper into that and see what was. Uh, appropriate or less appropriate uh, in this one. Uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, Asian represent. It's sort of uh, uh, adjacent, but I wanted to just mention for the, the people watching that in a few days I'm going to record a film studies, RPG Academy film studies, about one of my favorite movies, The Chinese Feast, and I will have the pleasure of being joined by uh, Banana Chan, uh, I believe. Uh, well, she published Jiang Chi Hustle. Uh, I hope my pronunciation yeah. is all right. And uh, as well as uh, Yvonne, who is from China as well, uh, like she's still in China. Uh, I hope I got it pronounced well. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm very excited. And uh, we've been chatting in the background about this movie, and I did not realize that they would have such a strong connection, a childhood connection to this movie, which got popular in France and Belgium for reasons in the 90s. So Chinese Feast, I recommend people to go check it out so you are ready to listen to the episode. Whenever it comes out, I'm not quite sure where it will be. It might be <laughs> February. 
Thank you so much, uh, Max. Uh, where can people find you when you, you wish to be found? Yeah, so I'm most active on Twitter. You can find me at Hydroforge. Uh, and, and Cal will probably include the link in there. Um, I will. Follow me on Twitter. You'll, you'll see the, the game announcement come out. You'll see the special events. Um, all the links will be there. Um, I'll have a pinned tweet that's got everything. You can go and buy the game there. Uh, I have an itch page where I'm selling Hanukkah Goblins uh, and we'll be releasing future games as a, there as well. And that is at hydroforge.itch.io, which is also linked on my Twitter. So really best place to find me, best place to interact, tweet about Hanukkah Goblins, tweet to me about anything, uh, I'll probably respond. So yeah, come, come and talk. Send your pictures uh, when you, you play it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when you light a candle thank you so much yeah. uh, thanks everyone for checking out the show please remember to follow us on Twitch to hit the yeah. subscribe button on YouTube uh, click the like leave a comment all of those beautiful subscribe on the show on Spotify and other platforms uh, thanks again and uh, yeah goodbye and uh, what, what's the Merry is Merry Hanukkah an appropriate seasonal greeting Say happy hanukkah happy hanukkah to to everyone out there thank you very much bye bye